Hello and welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Pierre Valencia. In 2013, a migratory stork was detained by Egyptian authorities on the suspicion of espionage. Fishermen on the east bank of the Nile handed the bird to the police after spotting a suspicious electronic device on the stork's leg. This cargo was eventually revealed to be a tracking device attached by Hungarian ornithologists studying migratory patterns, and the stork was released. Unfortunately, it was hunted by a group of children a day later and eaten. This sorry tale is at the center of the general stork, a video work by the Egyptian artist Heba Amin, and also of a new book of the same title, edited by Anthony Downey. This volume is part of the Research Practice Monograph series published by Sternberg Press and edited by Downey, each focusing on a single artwork. Anthony Downey is Professor of Visual Culture in the Middle East and North Africa, at Birmingham City University, and I'm happy that he joins me now to talk about the General Stork and the wider research practice series. Welcome to the show, Anthony. Hi, Pierre. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Oh, thank you for joining me. Anthony, this is going to be a potentially a very unusual episode for the New Books Network because we're going to try to talk not about one book, but maybe seven. And if we had unlimited time, I would possibly press for the eighth. But let's start, let's start the interview the way that we do usually on the network, which is to ask you about your research interest and in general how you came to this body of work and, and your interest in, in the things that are revealed in the research and practice series. Thank you, Pierre. Um, well, my research, if, if we think about it in terms of its uh, long-term interests, has been largely focused on the global south. I studied at Goldsmiths back in the 90s uh, with a number of theorists there, including people like Paul Gilroy and so forth. I'm very much focused on post-colonial theory, the development of post-colonial theory, uh, feminist epistemology, and the intersection of those particular areas of research into visual culture. For me, I think specifically, I was always interested in how and what we could glean from visual culture, the practice of visual culture, what does practice do to theory? What does practice do to our understanding of theory? So I was never particularly interested in theoretical frameworks. They could often be quite reductive. And I was always more interested in what artists were doing, what forms of research they were producing, what forms of knowledge they were engaging with, and how this was coming together into a structure or a project or a process. Uh, For me personally, this developed into a specific interest in the Middle East. Uh, I was interested largely in artists working from within the context of Iraq, for example, and Kurdistan, and also artists working across North Africa or the so-called Maghreb. So effectively, when I developed these interests, when I was working with a number of artists from Iraq, from Syria, from Egypt, including Heba Amin, whom you mentioned earlier, I was, again, specifically interested in not only what their practice was producing, but how they were producing alternative forms of knowledge or alternative forms of engagement with knowledge. And this led me to think through uh, what we would possibly need to understand that further. And it became apparent to me over time that we needed a formal engagement with the notion of practice-based research. That is to say, research produced by artists. Hence, submitting a proposal to Sternberg Press, to Caroline Schneider. And my suggestion at the time was very, very simple, and I hope the simplicity has carried through. And that was to gather together a series of books which looked at artists' research, how they researched, what they researched, how they brought that research to bear upon their projects, And Caroline immediately agreed to this, but it took at least another 18 months, I think two years before we saw the first publication, which was Michael Rakowitz's publication, I'm Good at Love, I'm Good at Hate, It's In Between, I Freeze, which looked at uh, a a concert that Leonard Cohen, the Canadian singer-songwriter Leonard Cohen, did not give uh, some years back. The second volume in the series looked at Larissa Sanseur, Uh, a project called Heirloom, which was premiered at the Venice Biennial in 2019. And the third volume was Heba Wayamin's The General Stork, which you mentioned in your introduction, which specifically looked at that event, 
the event of the stork who was captured by Egyptian authorities in 2013 with a tracking device and subsequently released and indeed eaten by local uh, children. So yes, that's the general idea behind these books. And they will continue with further volumes, which I am currently developing. Um, I gave in my introduction a very loose sketch of the central story that informs Heba Amin's body of work that at the moment happens to be on show at the Mosaic Rooms in West London in an exhibition called When I See the Future, I Close My Eyes, which you, Anthony, happen to have curated. Mm -hmm. Heba's work is, happens at the convergence of politics, technology, and architecture. She uses um, a whole range of aerial interest and aerial mm. modes of introspection mm. but it would be great if you could maybe describe in a little bit more detail the the body of work that you started with in putting mm -hmm. together this book and the way that you see Heba deploying mm -hmm. her particular epistemic methods mm. well the first thing I will say about this project is it was a long time in the making uh, Heba and I met many, many years ago, and indeed had been collaborating together since 2016 on various projects. And I guess it was around that time I first heard about The General Stork, which was a project that was in gestation at that time. The project itself is very specifically related to a series of events. One of those events is the capturing of a stork in 2013. The stork had a tracking device, and this tracking device alerted uh, local Egyptians to the potential fact that the stork was indeed a spy. Now, this might seem a tad risible, laughable even uh, comic, but uh, there has been many, many, many incidences of this. And I think what interested Heba in it was not so much the story is of interest, but it's the reaction to it. Uh, one, why would a local population think that a stork with a tracking device is a spy? And I think you have to contextualize that. We're talking about September of 2013. This is two years, well, almost three years, two and a half years since the Egyptian revolution of January 2011. And what you had at that specific moment in time was, dare I say, a general level of paranoia about external influences impacting upon the internal politics of Egypt. So it's almost perfectly understandable that people would be wary of this particular a bird with what appeared to be a camera attached to it. So I think what Heber was picking up on and what fascinated me about this project was the way in which it became a catalyst or a lightning rod for considering the geopolitics of Egypt, but also the geopolitics of aerial surveillance in the context of the Middle East. And that, of course, is a very capacious, broad issue. Uh, and you have to be very specific about what you mean by aerial surveillance and indeed who is being surveilled. But what Heba and I did, because the project itself was relatively fully formed and Heba started to pick on very specific areas of research. And one area was to look at the historical context for aerial research in the Middle East. And again, you know, this is fascinating. Uh, what you very quickly realize is that you could arguably present the history of aerial photography as the history of representing or photographing the Middle East. And the technologies of photographing, the technologies of representing the Middle East have become, of course, imbricated within global surveillance technologies. So if you think back to the early sort of photography, aerial photography of the 1910s, 1920s, these had a cadastral purpose. They were supposed to plot or indeed um, detail land for the purpose of partition. Uh, they also had a purpose of uh, detailing historical monuments. So there was the ostensible issue of preservation. So if you consider these two objectives of aerial photography, these were very clearly involved, if not absolutely fundamentally interwoven with a colonial ambition to partition land and a colonial ambition to not only partition land, but to take command of a specific terrain or topography. Now, again, this is not just about annexation. It's about occupation. 
And it's not just about occupying the present through forms of visual representation, forms of visual fixing. It equally is about occupying the future of that space. Now, if we take that as a given, that these technologies are not just about representing the past and the present, but they're also projecting into the future, they're projective or predictive, then what you have there is the kernel of what we now understand to be drone reconnaissance and satellite surveillance. Again, these forms, these technologies are about fixing time and space. They're about partitioning and quartering time and space. They're about measuring, quantifying time and space. And they're equally about, or ostensibly about, managing threat. And if you think about that, if you think about the way in which drone reconnaissance and satellite surveillance, as it is applied to the Middle East and its management of threat, this is the classic colonial imperative. The, not just the management of threat, but the suggestion that somehow the region is atavistically inclined towards conflict. Now, without getting into too much detail, of course, the arbitrary partitioning of land across the Middle East, and we might just need to mention the Sykes-Picot line here in 1916, which effectively partitioned Iraq and indeed gave rise to many of the conflicts which we are seeing today. But this arbitrariness was also a means to, I suppose for want of a better term, divide and rule. But it has continued and it's been developed through the digital technology, the digital imperative of surveillance, the way that continues to partition, the way it continues to exercise command, but something has happened there that is different. And perhaps I could talk about that very briefly. In the late 19th century, early 20th century, a lot of the images that were being produced from, for example, uh, aerial photographs were largely about humans, for want of a better term, taking photographs. So the human eye was still part of this. And it was largely about uh, subjects, humans, viewing those images. So there was still a relatively intimate relationship there. But of course, uh, a lot of these technologies were based upon remote forms of visualization. So cameras, for example, attached to the undercarriage of airplanes. And these were taking images which would not be possible to take if you were a human subject. And Hadrun Faraki has referred to these images as phantom images. And they are a precursor to another term that Faraki uses, operational images. And just to be clear, operational images are images produced by machines for machines. It's a form of disembodying the human eye or indeed disengaging the human agent from the process of producing images. Now, again, what you see there is the predicate or the foreshadowing of drone reconnaissance and satellite surveillance in as much as the images produced by modern forms, modern technologies of visualization are largely operational images. They're images produced by machines for machines. The difference here, of course, is that those images can affect real world impact. So for example, with the ascendancy of autonomous drone warfare, you have a relatively recursive system of image production that is making decisions through algorithmic rationalizations about who is a target and indeed who is not a target, who is a combatant, who is a non-combatant. Now, as we know from many incidences, uh, this rationalization of life and debt has resulted in attacks upon civilians, for example. And I'm talking, of course, about an attenuated use of drone reconnaissance and satellite surveillance, but it still goes back and replicates that colonial imperative towards an imaginative command over a specific re region. And largely that imaginative command, in our time at least, has turned into an algorithmic command in as much as it's algorithms that are powering the very surveillance technologies that have now become largely autonomous from the human agents who originally programmed them. So what Heaven's Project opens up is a whole issue around scopic regimes, digital warfare, and for me personally, tracing the present, for example, the paranoia around digital surveillance, looking at the impact of digital surveillance, the impact of hyper-visualization on a region, 
back to the emergence of imperialism and colonization in the 17th and 18th centuries. And to see that lineage throughout uh, is remarkable because the objectives remain the same, even though the means of extracting information have indeed changed. And that's kind of fascinating because I think Heber makes the line, and you do in the book, just by reproducing some of the historical 1920s aerial photography and contemporary satellite imagery, Heber also extends this line to the idea of the surveillance of a female mm. body, which, which takes it on a completely different scale. This future direction of, of observation that leads to control, like to me recently was rendered very palpable when I became aware of the fact that Soviet agents resident in the UK were able to produce maps of the realm that were more accurate than the government ordnance survey maps being mm. produced in England and, and in mm. Britain. And I guess this is also a good moment to mention another volume in the series, which is yet to be published, as I understand, and that is on the work of the American artist Trevor mm -hmm. Paglen, who came to quite a lot of prominence maybe a decade ago with his photographs of... Um, American surveillance and indeed combat mm -hmm. drones taking off and on um, military bases in Nevada and, and locations like that, but has also worked um, with artificial intelligence and algorithmic understandings. Trevor and I worked together in late 2019 as part of the, I guess, the programming around his show at the Barbican. Uh, he had a show at the Barbican called From Apple to Anomaly. And Trevor was very specifically looking at the way in which data sets were being used to program algorithms. And he was specifically looking at uh, the largest data set in the world, actually, which is called ImageNet, and the way in which its categorization systems, its epistemological systems for categorizing information, had inbuilt bias. Now, of course, this shouldn't come as any surprise. Algorithms can often be seen as somehow abstract inventions or abstract recursive processes. But of course, they start with uh, a human programmer. And of necessity, they, to some extent, involve the, uh, involve the very biases that we see in social orders in society. They, 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 they channel those biases. So when ImageNet set up its system of classification, it, it repeatedly had terminologies within it which could be considered to be not just uh, biased, but outright offensive. So Trevor worked on this uh, for some years, produced the project, and we subsequently had a conversation about uh, a separate project that he was working on, which was looking at algorithms, which would become part of this series. So I want to, to use this as an opportunity to explore a little bit the way in which the artist's engagement with those histories and those um, understandings of technologies that we alluded to, whether it's aerial photography and mapping or drone surveillance or indeed artificial intelligence, what it is at a very fundamental level that an artist does mm. with um, with that kind of research. Mm, mm. Yes, I mean, this is a question I return to again and again uh, throughout the series and indeed with other projects, curatorial projects and research projects. So to articulate your question, what do artists bring to research into, for example, digital technologies? Now, it's, it seems to me, and working with artists such as Heba Amin, what they encourage is a process of thinking from within these processes rather than just reflecting upon them. Now, I think just to unpack that, we could, for example, critique images taken from airplanes of Egypt in the 1920s. And there has been a huge body of research on that. And it's fascinating. And it, it is largely fit for purpose because this critique effectively highlights the extent to which the colonial project is not about representing, it's about producing the reality of a region. And in that moment of producing that reality, that is about command. It's about controlling those realities, not just in the present, but indeed in the future. But things have shifted. We no longer necessarily 
work with images as such. If you think about surveillance technologies and drone reconnaissance, the image itself is merely a, an afterthought almost of a computerized process. Computers don't use images. Computers use data. Uh, that data is largely inaccessible to us in any other form than the interface of an image. That seems to be a concession to the human eye. It shows us an image of a terrain, but that's not what a computer is looking at. And that's certainly not what an algorithm is working with in relation to visualizing, for example, the topography of modern day Baghdad or indeed uh, uh, you know, Iraq more generally. So then you have to ask yourself a question, how do you engage with these recursive processes? How do you find a way to work from within a space that is recalcitrant to vision, that in fact produces a model of the human eye that is an anachronism? Because we are not engaged any longer in looking at these spaces. Computers do that for us. So how, again, do we utilize research? How do artists utilize practice to engage with this process? Now, again, this is what fascinates me. And I'm thinking not just of Heba here. I'm thinking of a number of people that I've worked with, including Trevor Paglin, including Shona Illingwert, uh, Helen Kazan, and the way in which they encourage a form of research which the viewer undertakes, which encourages them to think from within and through these digital processes rather than just reflect upon them. Because the moment of reflection in and of itself is, it's quite passive. You can critically reflect, of course, but working from within the processes, working from within the constituent parts of how these images, and I put in images here in inverted commas, are produced through digital methods, I think is a much more engaged and potentially more engaging way of carrying forth a sort of critique of what these images, again in inverted commas, mean today. So staying inside those research processes that you described, I want us to turn back to the first book in the series, which is I'm Good at Love, I'm Good at Hate, It's In Between, I Freeze, which looks at a single artwork by the artist Michael Rakowitz. And while this is a work that could not in its subject matter be any more different from the work we've just been discussing, it does share certain characteristics with the work of Hebe Amin and indeed Trevor Paglin in as much as it is decisively research-based, not only in constituting its materials, but also in asking quite significant epistemic questions. Yes, um, I think that was very important from the outset. And I, one of the questions which I set was how artists such as Michael Rakowitz and indeed Heba Amin were encouraging us to think from within the realm of practice, not just to reflect upon practice, but to think from within that realm. And as we know, that realm is a very discursive, speculative realm. Art practice can take many different routes, many different areas. I was specifically interested in the way in which Michael performed and indeed undertook quite a considerable amount of historical research before embarking upon this project. And the project itself opens up a field of historiography, uh, historical investigation into a very specific series of events. Now, the ostensible starting point for that is a series of concerts that Leonard Cohn, the Canadian singer-songwriter, gave in Israel. Uh, Cohen, interestingly, in 1973, he had been living on the island of Hydra with his then girlfriend, Susan Elrod, and his son, Adam. And upon the outbreak of the 1973 Arab-Israeli war, he decided to up sticks and travel to Israel. I don't think Cohen really knew what he was doing, or indeed understood what he was doing, I don't think his intention, for example, was to join the war, despite his own histrionic sort of interpretation of that. But he did end up with a traveling troupe of singers who are collectively known, self-appointedly known as the Geneva Convention. And they traveled across Israel at that time, ending up in Sinai, where Cohen gave an impromptu performance for Israeli soldiers. And it's an extraordinary moment. Uh, and Michael has spoken about this in depth because it has many, many implications, many ramifications for Michael's own work and indeed how we understand 
levels of engagement and levels of practice. But very briefly, I mean, Cohen's experience was quite disturbing for him. He recounts a story. In fact, his, his one of his early biographers recounts a story, Aaron Adele recounts a story, where body bags are deposited in the camp where he is uh, due to sing. And he finds this, obviously, uh, very disturbing and starts to weep. But he is instructed by one of the Israeli soldiers not to weep because they were Egyptian soldiers. And Cohen himself recounts this moment of relief and then feeling even more disturbed at his own relief that somehow he would feel it excusable not to weep for Egyptian soldiers. He then wrote a controversially, in retrospect, gave a concert for Ariel Sharon. And when I say a concert, these were very impromptu. He sang a few songs. There's photographs of Cohen and Ariel Sharon in the desert, in Sinai, in 1973. And these photographs, uh, th- these photographs have been circulating widely for many, many years. And Cohen's relationship to Ariel Sharon is quite interesting. I, I think he venerates, to a certain extent, Ariel Sharon. But equally, he seems very skeptical. He's quite sort of canny. Uh, Cohen would never fully commit to anything. So uh, uh, whether it be a relationship or indeed a political standpoint. So it's a very interesting, very sort of difficult relationship with Ariel Sharon. Now, as you might know, Sharon went on in 1982 to become uh, what many consider to be the uh, butcher of Beirut. Uh, this refers directly to the Sabra and Shatila massacre in Beirut in September 1982. Uh, his reputation internationally was effectively uh, called into question after this. And in fact, he was uh, the subject of quite a significant number of judicial reviews. Anyhow, we fast forward and we come to a point where Michael himself attends a Leonard Cohen concert in Chicago in 2009 and is totally bowled away by it and indeed uh, goes home that evening and does a considerable amount of research on Leonard Cohen, during which time he finds uh, the photographs of Ariel Sharon and Leonard Cohen in the desert in 1973. So it's a very mixed reaction that Michael has, and it's an extraordinary reaction, and I think it's encapsulated quite brilliantly in the title of the book, I'm Good at Love, I'm Good at Hate, It's In Between, I Freeze. Now, this is a quote from a Leonard Cohen song called A Thousand Kisses Deep. And I think it it perfectly sums up that sense of stasis or limbo, uh, the sense of action and inaction, uh, this inability to engage, which Cohen himself obviously felt, but Michael Rakovitz similarly feels in that particular moment of both discovering his hero, soon-to-be hero, Leonard Cohen, but also discovering that Cohen was in some way complicit with uh, the 1972 Arab-Israeli war, specifically through his relationship to Ariel Sharon. So it's a very kind of complicated story to begin with, and it becomes even more complicated as we go forward. One one observation that I had, even touching the whole series of books, is that there is this layer upon layer of these kind of complications with which any type of analysis has to contend. Mm. You remark on this very personal, personalized um, relationship that Michael Rakovitz has with this history that he uncovers. And you do it, for me, in a completely disarming way by introducing your own historiographic mm. relationship mm. To, to, to Leonard Cohen. So I think it would be good to understand the layers that, with which you approach mm. this complex, but, but in a kind of a nicely, nicely mm. round self-contained project to maybe explain a little bit the method that you find Michael Rakovitz deploying and then then you two, in my, my mm. understanding, mm. replicate as a critic of this whole project. Well, uh, perhaps I should have said at the outset, uh, not only is Michael a huge fan of, of Leonard Cohen, of course, I'm a huge fan of Leonard Cohen and have been <laughs> traditionally and indeed historically a fan of Leonard Cohen. And that goes back to uh, my youth in Dublin in the early 1980s, being introduced to Leonard Cohen by uh, a then friend of mine, who convinced me not only to listen to Leonard Cohen, fall in love with Leonard Cohen, but he equally convinced me that Leonard Cohen was dead. Uh, And we're going back quite some time pre-Google here. (laughs) So I assumed for at least a year that Leonard Cohen was indeed dead. Uh, I was quickly disabused of that when Leonard Cohen released an album in 1984 called Various Positions. 
which was quickly followed up by a concert, a live concert in Dublin, uh, which I attended. And indeed, one of the great things for me about this book was going back and researching that concert, finding out what Cohen sang at the time. And I, I have very fond memories. I was I went with my then girlfriend to this concert. I was relatively young, I guess, 16, 17. Uh, Cohen was, and indeed still is to a large extent, uh, one of my heroes when it comes to singer-songwriting. And that concert was extraordinary. Uh, it wasn't the only time I saw Cohen, but um, it, 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 it has left an indelible memory. So when Michael and I met many, many years later, and at least a decade before we produced this book, one of the things we bonded over was Leonard Cohen. And we had many, many conversations, many, many evenings talking about Cohn and other matters. And what a serendipitously in 2016, a week after Leonard Cohn's death, on November the 7th, I went to Ramallah to give a talk. And I didn't notice at the time, but Michael Rakovitz was there. He was in Ramallah. He was giving some talks as well. Mm. And as soon as I found out, we made contact immediately. And we spent about a week in the occupied Palestinian territories. And we did hold an impromptu wake for Leonard Cohn in the garage bar mm. in Ramallah. I'm not sure how many people would be familiar with this bar, but it's a very you know bohemian open bar where playing Leonard Cohn, despite the fact you know, you're in the Ramallah, did not seem out of place. And indeed, many of the customers at the garage bar were not only familiar with Cohn, but there was quite a convivial atmosphere. There was a lot of singing. There was a lot of whiskey drank. There was a lot of, there was a lot of talk and there was a lot of conversation. And it was at precisely that moment that Michael told me over a period of about a week, the entire story behind his fascination with Leonard Cohn, his research into the 1973 Arab-Israeli war through the lens of Leonard Cohn's relationship to Ariel Sharon, and indeed uh, a series of concerts that Leonard Cohn gave in the Middle East in 2009. And it was up to that point that we'd kind of arrived at something of a, I, I, I guess I understood where Michael was coming from, and I understood the relationship of uh, Cohen's music to Michael's practice. And if I may, just very briefly, the, the although Michael and I were talking in 2016, his specific project, or at least the genesis of it, came out of a concert that Leonard Cohen was due to give in Ramallah in 2009, Cohen had given a concert, was scheduled to give a concert, and did indeed give a concert in the Ramat Gan Stadium, which is the uh, the one-time national stadium of Israel until 2014. And the Ramat Gan Stadium is in Tel Aviv. There were protests against this in 2009, and Cohen decided, or his management decided, it was never quite clear who decided what, but it was decided that a concert would be given in Ramallah. Uh, this concert was not given. The Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, PACBI, mm -hmm. they released a statement at the time saying something to the effect that Ramallah would not receive Leonard Cohen as long as he is intent on whitewashing Israel's colonial apartheid regime. So the concert was never given. And that's an extraordinary thing in and of itself, because this is precisely what Michael picks up on and what we pick up on in the book. And it's a very simple question. What happens to the work of art under the conditions of boycott? And this in and of itself goes back to the original question uh, or the original element that we're talking about. Michael performs, undertakes this body of research, which leads us to a singular question. And that question is quite definitive. What happens to the work of art under the conditions of boycott? Now, that question has become even more attenuated in our time. And it became more attenuated for Michael because Michael took it upon himself, uh, rather brilliantly, I think, to become a ventriloquist of sorts, a performer. He tracked down the playlist that Cohen would have played, potentially would have played in Ramallah in 2019 and offered to perform the concert that Leonard Cohen did not give in Ramallah. So Michael undertook to become this vessel, dare I say, this enunciative vessel to perform a concert by Leonard Cohen that had never been given. Unfortunately, uh, Michael similarly became subject to the complications of boycott 
or let's say the imperatives of boycott and did not give the concert. So what you end up with here is two cancelled concerts coming from different directions, coming from different imperatives, coming from different intentions to a certain extent, both being cancelled under the conditions of boycott. And out of that, and I think this is what attracted me to this project in particular, out of this double refusal, this double negative, you get a positive, so to speak, in as much as Michael utilized this opportunity to investigate the conditions of boycott and its impact upon practice. And I guess the question is beautifully encapsulated by, by, by the, the fact that you opened this book with your story of your Dublin childhood, which is that the registered of the personal experience mm. and of this kind of positivist understanding of the other question, which is, was Leonard Cohen a mm. Zionist and what implications does that have? But these things do not necessarily ever come to speak to one another on a com common plane. Mm. You know, I, I think this question is perhaps both important and totally unimportant, so we should address it. Um, it would appear on the face of it that Cohen supported the Zionist cause, his involvement in the 1972 Arab-Israeli war, for example, his singing to Ariel Sharon in the Sinai Desert. But again, I don't think Michael's project is asking such a simplistic question. Was Cohen a Zionist or did Cohen, through his avowed intention to perform in Ramallah, uh, support the Palestinian cause? I think it's something much, much more complex um, that always consistently in danger of being reduced to that simple question. Cohen's relationship to Zionism, and indeed Cohen's relationship to politics more generally, is nuanced. And it's precisely that level of nuance. It's precisely that in-betweenness. It's precisely that notion of not taking sides that I think defines, to a large extent, Cohen's own experience of life itself. Uh, Cohen was famously depressive. Uh, he suffered from mental health issues all his life. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, he was experimented upon in his early teens. Yes. yes, it's a fascinating story, something I'm researching presently, but he was given uh, medical doses of lysergic acid in an experiment in Montreal. And there is a photograph, we're not quite sure yet if it's actually Cohn in the photograph, hooded in, a, in an experiment. Um, and he himself... It's, it's, it's never quite clear, but if you read through Cohn, it's never quite clear whether he felt depressed as a child and undertook this treatment, or indeed this treatment in some way resulted in his own uh, depression. Hmm. But what, of course, Cohn encapsulates is, I, I don't use the term uh, bipolarity, I think that's too sort of medicalized, but he's, he's somewhere in between, and it's the moment of being in between that consistently creates a generative process for him. Now. What happened, of course, and I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but when I uh, I, tra I was traveling back and forth a lot from around 2010 until recently to uh, the occupied Palestinian territories. And of course, you have to go to Tel Aviv Airport, Ben Gurion Airport. And in 2017, when I was going through Ben Gurion Airport, in fact, a, a few days before I met with Michael there in Ramallah, there was an exhibition in the concourse of Ben Gurion Airport, and it was titled 120 Years of Zionism. And they had used a photograph, the famous photograph of Leonard Cohen singing in mm -hmm. 1973 in the Sinai Desert to Ariel Sharon. And that to me seemed quite reductive. Uh, it seemed to co-opt a very complex individual who had complex thoughts, who had complex relationships to reality, history, life more generally. And that moment of co-option is quite problematic because it's reductive. It's, it's very reductive of Cohen's own attitude. Now, if you do read, as I have done, everything practically published on Leonard Cohen, you will find that even now he could be co-opted for either side. He could be reduced to either side. Now, I think what Michael's project does is it blasts open such simplicities and engages with the complexity of the man as an artist and what it is to produce art under political conditions and under specifically the condition of boycott. I think the fascinating thing here is that we, we, we're looking at a series of events that somehow predate our current 
preoccupation with cancel culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the kind of tendency to flatten political views, political ideas into this kind of bipolar, mm -hmm. good side, bad side. I think one thing to, to maybe underline once more is the deployment of the personal. And maybe you could talk a little bit about Michael's attempt to embody Leonard Cohen mm -hmm. and how that contributes a productive space to mm -hmm. maybe introduce new ones on uncertainty. You know, I think that word embody is interesting here because Michael does an uncanny version of Leonard Cohen. Um, Michael, as you know, is Iraqi Jewish uh, American. Uh, Cohen himself, uh, Cohen, you know, practiced the Jewish faith throughout his, his life. Uh, he was also a Buddhist um, and indeed did retire for many, many years to Mount Baldy in California to practice Buddhism. And I think for Michael, this embodiment is, again, I go back and use this term ventriloquism. It is internalizing the voice of the other, and in that moment of enunciation, practicing a solidarity with that other. But it's also about the subject's agency. It's about Michael's agency, uh, his intentionality, his objective to perform the concert that Leonard Cohen never gave. So when Michael takes on this particular enunciative position, that's a political position in and of itself because it progresses a certain standpoint. It tries to address an historical elision, the fact of the non-concert, mm -hmm. by restaging a concert. But in a moment where that Michael's concert is equally, you know, cancelled or, uh, you know, postponed, it doesn't stop there. And I think this is what fascinates me. This is a process, and that process speaks to many, many different directions. It speaks to many, many different contingencies. So even, even in the moment of the non-event, we have an event, and that event speaks to the geopolitics specifically of the region, but equally it speaks to Michael's own relationship to Leonard Cohn. I'm not sure if I mentioned this to you, but Michael managed to procure on the internet uh, Leonard Cohn's original typewriter, which Cohen had been using in Hydra in the 1970s. And it comes with a certificate and it's got its own model number and it's being confirmed that this is actually Leonard Cohen's typewriter. And Michael did write a letter on that typewriter to Leonard Cohen, which we assume but have no proof Leonard Cohen read. And it must be somewhere in Leonard Cohen's archives if, he, if indeed he <laughs> did receive it. And that, that, that letter is quite an interesting thing in and of itself as well, because Michael is writing to Leonard Cohn as an artist, one artist to another artist, asking very simple questions about what it is to perform, what it is to be an artist, what that responsibility, if I can use that term, entails. Now, Cohn's death, of course, put an end to that communication, uh, but again opened up, as the non-event of the concert opened up, a further series of questions about how Cohn was being co-opted subsequently. And again, I think what Michael's project does is it brings a methodology to bear, a research, a speculative research methodology to bear upon these questions and opens up the potential for engagement as opposed to closing down engagement. Well, Anthony, thank you so much for sharing these incredible stories and artworks and, and your insights. But before I let you go, I wanted to ask you about the future of the series. What I would say finally, Pierre, is that the series research practice has evolved since it was launched. Initially, I had a relatively simple format, and that format usually involved myself and the artist working very closely together on one single project, which we then presented through the research, not through the finished project, not through its manifestation, but through the research that went into it. So we were looking at notebooks, we were looking at email communications, we were looking at social media postings, and we were looking, in fact, at abandoned drafts of the projects themselves to show how artists think through these issues. Now, the series has evolved since then because it immediately became apparent to me, too, that artists, as part of the research, were working with other researchers, they were working with other writers, they were working with digital analysts, digital practitioners, activists. So what I have subsequently done with Volume 2, which is on the work of Larissa Sensor, and Volume 3, which is on the work of Heba Amin, was I've asked the artist to invite uh, 
researchers and indeed individuals who have influenced their work and their research. So for example, with Larissa Sansura's book, Nat Muller, the curator Nat Muller was involved with writing the essay and she was indeed the curator of Larissa's show for Venice. With Heba Amin's book, we invited a, a number of individuals to work with us on that, including Laura Poitras, uh, Adele Iskander, and Haitam Mossad. Haitam Mossad was the man who found uh, Menes, the stork, in 2013. And I have to I have to say that this is this is for me the breakthrough in the entire series that to have that story told from yes kind of detached yes. perspective is is a morsel that one would would be looking for and critique. Well, that was that was in and of itself quite extraordinary. And I should just say that the next two books in the series, we I've invited Lara Baladi, uh, an Egyptian artist, and we reached out to Noam Chomsky to interview Noam as part of this book. And he was very generous with his time and energy. And indeed, we ended up speaking to him for about an hour. And we will include that interview in the book because it has a uh, his work had a huge influence on my work, of course, but also uh, was an influence on Lara Baladi's work. I'm also working with uh, the Lebanese artist Roy Samaha in his volume, and Roy has invited Jalal Tufik and Miriam De Rosa to be part of those volumes. So the series has evolved, Pierre, over time. It, I think we're getting more contributors involved, uh, thinking again about inviting the artists to invite writers and other artists to get involved in as much as they impacted upon their research and so forth. So I'm hoping going forward that that element of this series will grow. Well, Anthony, it's good to hear that things change and the methods evolve um, at this stage. Maybe a good idea to me to disclose to listeners that Anthony is actually my PhD <laughs> supervisor at Birmingham City University, so I shall be using these statements in my own mm, defense mm. any moment now. you now. mention it. <laughs> Anthony, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure to speak to you about the, the series. It's been a pleasure, Pierre, and thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you for your questions, and I wish you luck with uh, upcoming podcasts. The General Stork by Heba Amin and edited by Anthony Downey is published by Sternberg. The other titles in the series include Erlum, which focuses on the work of Larissa Sensu, and I'm Good at Love, I'm Good at Hate, It is in Between I Freeze by Marka Rakovitz. Future releases will include reflections on Rala Baladi and Roy Samaha. I'm Pierre Delancey, and the editor is Marshall Poe. Thank you for listening, and join us next time.